Father in heaven, as we bow before you in that most holy place where intercession is going on in our behalf, though we do not deserve it. We come boldly before the throne as Paul has asked us to do, having confessed our sins already and asking that as we gather together on this conference call in our own homes, that you will be in the midst of us, that you will send your spirit to be in each place, each dwelling and each heart. And this morning we ask that as we open your word together and as we study together, that your spirit will stir us to understand things that have been lost and forgotten and that we will come into line with you, that we might be prepared for your very, very soon coming. Your patience, your mercy, your long suffering have nearly come to an end and we want to be prepared to be able to look up and say, lo, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayer in Jesus name and for his sake. Amen. Okay, this morning, um, I wanted to mention, you know, I get a lot of calls where people are saying, well, I, I started watching that 1888 um, series by Mark and I don't get how you guys cannot believe in righteousness by faith and this kind of thing. And, you know, Jones and Wagner were right in 88, but they went off. And um, that's not the truth or Healdsburg College would not have folded because in 1884, um, E.J. Wagner, who was a teacher there, was teaching what he taught in 1888 and what he taught in 1890 and what he taught later on when he signed his name in 1903 to Living Temple by Kellogg. Um, they were teaching the same thing all along. And so a lot of us don't realize this because there's been a major cover-up, a major cover-up. So don't fault yourself. We've had faulty information from the leadership for years. But the thing I want to point out is Healdsburg College folded. G.I. Butler wrote a letter, several letters to Ellen White. And in the one, the last one, he said, I do not believe you're getting my letters. I'm begging you. What do I tell the parents when they say my child is being taught wrong, incorrectly? Do I take them out of this school? He says, I don't want problems. I don't want one of our institutions to fold. And yet that's exactly what happened. Healdsburg College was closed because so many students were removed from there and they finally uh, bought land up on, on Angwin Hill and started Pacific Union College to take its place. But the same sentiments were there, just um, done differently. But I wanted to read to you what came in this week with one of the people who's had confusion about this righteousness by faith uh, message that it looks like through Willie's help that his mother condoned or, or sided with. Uh, um, this lady says, we have been listening to a book by M. L. Andreasen. It's called Without Fear or Favor. Something caught my attention and here it is. I have heard many versions, this is M. L. Andreasen in this book now, he says, quote, I have heard many versions of what took place in Minneapolis. Someday, if I ever get time, I would like to tell the story as I heard it recounted at the meetings held in College View by the men who were the leaders in opposition to Sister White. They did not consider the message of Jones and Wagner to be the real issue. The real issue, according to my informers, was whether Sister White was to be permitted to overrule the men who carried the responsibility of the work. It was an attempt to overthrow the position of the spirit of prophecy, and it seemed the men in opposition carried the day. Eventually, she left for Australia, where she stayed nine years. They sent her there, by the way. She says in one place, God did not bring me here. But she went because 
they sent her. Um, he says eventually she, uh, it was there that a plan of organization which called for union conferences was tried that received her blessing. It may not have because there was still dominance. They were not treating all ye as brethren. Some were trying to take superior roles and then command everybody with that as well, which we've studied out. But that's a whole other thing. Anyway, he says, this was implemented on the general conference level. As interpreted by some, the Minneapolis conference, this is the 1888 conference, was a revolt against Sister White. If this is so, or if that is so, excuse me, it throws some light on the Omega apostasy. This is from the book, Without Fear or Favor, pages 42 to 44. And this individual says, this confirms the series on 1888 that we did. And E.J. Wagner and A.T. Jones's Messages of Righteousness by Faith. And indeed it does. And though the whole church and all the independents go against it, we cannot stand anywhere else because we've studied, we've seen the results of this for 30 and 40 years. We've, re we've seen the results of this message. And this is what we've been teaching. Um, we have Ellen White's pamphlet she wrote in 18, uh, uh, pamphlet 117, 1889, a year, uh, actually just a few months, because October 1888 was when the Minneapolis meetings happened. But in 1889, she put this pamphlet 117 together, and it's about the testimonies being rejected. And so that was the issue of 1888. It wasn't a rejection of a message by Jones and Wagner. So I just wanted to bring that out to clarify to those of you and to also bring this to the table with, um, with ML Andreessen because if you want a second witness then Mark and Melanie and what they're saying and what others have said before us, here it is from Without Fear or Favor, pages 42 to 44. And I just have to add to that, we'd never heard of that publication no. until that text came to us this last week. Yes. So it's another confirmation of what we're saying. And what we're saying is study to show yourself approved unto God. Jesus himself, brothers and sisters, said, if ye love me, keep my commandments. There's no other way. He's not going to let us sit on a, a couch uh, watching movies and eating bonbons and do all the work for us. He expects us to do our part. And I appreciate the song that was chosen this morning. It shows that we have a job to do to serve our master. We can't go to head, heaven on flowery beds of ease. So I am sorry I never got this publication done. It's been an overwhelming thing for me. But we do have, he's going to put on the, the monitor he, um, here. He's the, um, the rundown of uh, these first 13 pages. And it's also on our website. And I sent it out to all of you or most of you, if you didn't get it, um, let me know. I won't be able to do anything about it this morning, but um, later on I can help you with it. So this publication is from three publications that you can find on the Hohen Research Library. It's, and I, didn't, I forgot to bring them in here, so I don't have the numbers of them, but one is called Tunnel of Love. The other is called Love, Hour of Temptation. And the third one is called Unconditional Insanity. Unconditional Insanity. And I've been trying to put these pamphlets together just to, because Hohen goes into a lot of stuff that was happening in his time in the, the conference church. And a lot of people don't know those leaders. They don't know. And I think it's a diversion for us because those people are dead and gone and the rebellion still goes on. And I don't keep up with the conference church enough to know. I just know that the, the teachings of this have come down to everybody who's in a home church because the Jesuits um, determined, and so did the Wiccan witches in the 80s, that now that they had all the denominations, they were going after the splinter groups and those down to the home churches. So that's what's happening now. So um, in brief, um, 
this is what I've been trying to do and we will eventually have this into a document. I don't know how soon with trying to finish this um, construction job we have going that we want done this month. So anyway, let's begin. Um, what is love? And when I went to this document and I started trying to pull things together, I realized what we're facing today in not only the world with this LBTGQ, XYZ, blah, 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 but in the church as well, the Jesuits have redefined what love is. And so I went to Cruden's Concordance and this is how we're going to start out with the Cruden's Concordance. So, um, so the, 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 if those of you who have a Cruden's Concordance, most of this first few pages of our pamphlet will be out of that. So love, Cruden's Concordance to the Holy Scriptures, 1806 says, love signifies, number one, a natural passion inclining us to delight in an object. And let's look up these verses together. The first one is Genesis 27, 4. Genesis 27, 4. Somebody want to read that for us, please. Genesis 27, verse 4. Genesis 27, 4. Do I have a reader? I'll read. Thank you. And make me savory meat such as I love, and bring it to me that I may eat, that my soul may bless thee before I die. Okay. So here is a passion inclining us to delight in something. And Isaac loved the savory meat. In other words, um, Esau knew how to take herbs, savory, and put it with the, the venison that he, he caught on the kill and make it very, very palatable for his father. And so his father asked for that. He said, go get that for me and I'll give you the blessing. So Genesis 29, 20 is our next verse. Genesis 29, verse 20. Do I have a reader for this one? And Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed unto him but a few days for the love he had to her. Thank you. Seven years he served. That's, that's, a, that's a deep love. <laughs> Seven years he worked for that gal. And I wanted to read out of Cece, and I asked Mark, is that, um, I couldn't find our, I Conflict, thought it was. I looked it up, it's Conflict and Courage. It's Conflict and Courage, okay, we don't have that book either. So in there it says, in early times custom required the bridegroom before the ratification of a marriage engagement to pay of sum of money to the father of his wife. Excuse me, or its equivalent in other property according to his circumstances, I skipped a line, to the father of his wife. This was regarded as a safeguard to the marriage relation, but provision was made to test those who had nothing to pay for a wife. They were permitted to labor for the father whose daughter they loved the length of time being regulated by the value of the dowry required. When the suitor was faithful in his services and proved in other respects worthy, he obtained the daughter as his wife, and generally the dowry which the father had received was given her at her marriage. So this was all to test this love of the suitor, okay? The ancient custom though sometimes abused, as by Laban, was productive of good results when the suitor was required to render service to secure his bride. A hasty marriage was prevented, and there was opportunity to test the depth of his affections. 
as well as his ability to provide for a family. In our time, many evils result from pursuing an opposite course. It is often the case that persons before marriage have little opportunity to become acquainted with each other's habits and dispositions. And so far as everyday life is concerned, they are virtually strangers when they unite their interests at the altar. And many find too late that they are not adapted to each other. And lifelong wretchedness is the result of their union. Page 66 of Conflict and Courage. So this, this ancient custom tested the depth of love. And we don't do that today. She says it's too bad we don't do that today. But I think a lot, like she says, a lot of evils would be um, saved if we had the understanding that love is a broad spectrum. There's more than one type of love, and we'll go through this and see this. Back to Cruden's Concordance. This natural passion can be deep or shallow, for it is run by feelings and circumstances. What if Jacob had gotten six months into working hard out in the fields, day and night? I don't know how many of you have worked animals, but we were on a 3,000 acre ranch with 6,000 sheep and 450 cows and 12 bulls and 68 rams and um, 250 goats and how many he goats. We only had six or eight, didn't we? Yeah. They didn't have many he goats. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we had a lot of animals and you're not allowed to sleep a full night without something going wrong. You got it. And when we had, we had bummers, we had upwards to 180 bummers at a time, meaning the lambs that were rejected or sick or something. And so I was up around the clock for three months running. I had, I'd catch naps throughout the day and night, but every two hours I had bums to feed, bottle feed. And so you're feeding three, four, three or four at a time. You put two bottles between your legs and a couple in your hands, holding on to the neck of the bottle like this with your fingers, and you've got lambs jerking on those bottles. You know, I'm holding a, somebody's flashlight here, but you'd have another bottle here, and you hold on to them and let the lambs nurse because we couldn't get through them all in two hours um, or in an hour and a half because I had other things to do um, in that amount of time. But... Jacob worked hard those seven years. And if he'd have quit six months into this, it would have shown that his love for Rachel was not that deep. But he went seven years. So, for it is run by feelings and circumstances. Exodus 21.4. Let's look at this. This is an incredible um, little piece of work here in the scriptures that I've often thought about. Um, Exodus 21, 4. Do I have a reader for this? I can. Okay. Read loud, please. Okay. <clears throat> if his master had given him a wife and she had borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her child, children, shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. Read 5 and 6 as well, Brother Floyd, please. And if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife, my children, and I will go, not go out, uh, not go out free, then his master shall bring him into the, unto the judges. He shall also bring him to the door or unto the door post, and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. So he had an earring put into his ear to show that he had lo he loved his master and his children and, and wife so much that he didn't want to leave them. And he would rather stay there and be a servant or slave to his master the rest of his life than go out free. And the, the earring in the ear was the sign, I have chosen to serve my master the rest of my life. The rest of my life. So, Deuteronomy 10, 19. This is the Lord's admonition to us. Deuteronomy 10, 19. 
There are different types of love. Deuteronomy 10, 19. Do I have a reader? I can read it. Thank you. Love you therefore the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Thank you, Sandy. So here we have God's admonition to Israel. When somebody came wandering into their territory, all hungry, etc., they were to take them in, feed them, and be kind to them, to love them, and not to be hateful toward them. That's God's admonition. And he reminds them, see, you were strangers in somebody else's land. So treat the stranger nicely. So what is love? Back to Cruden's Concordance. This is number two in there. It says, a gracious principle. What's a principle? What is a principle? I looked it up. It says, a general truth, a law comprehending many subordinate truths as the principles of morality, of law, and of government. So a principle is something set. It's fixed, okay? It's fixed. It cannot be changed. Um, a principle or habit. And a habit is a disposition or condition of the mind or body acquired by custom or a frequent repetition of the same act, held or retained. The effect of custom or frequent repetition. So if we do something over and over, they say if you do something three times, it becomes a habit. Mm. That's not very many. I, I've done some things over and over and over again. Like when I get up in the morning, the first thing I do is drink a whole uh, three, three quarters of a quart of water. And the mornings I don't do that, half an hour later, I'm dry, really dry. Because my body says, hey, wait a minute, you got out of bed and you went right to the chair to read and you haven't given me any water. So that's a habit. It becomes a habit. So love, according to Cruden's Concordance, is a gracious principle or habit wrought in the soul by God, which inclines us to delight in esteem and earnestly desire to enjoy an interest in God's favor and communion with him as our chief good portion and happiness and the fountain of all perfection and excellency and which likewise disposes us to do good to all, especially to such as resemble God in holiness and bear his image. Let's look up 1 John 4, 19 to 21. 1 John 4, 19 to 21. Do I have a reader for that? 1 John 4, 19 to 21. I can read, Molly. Okay. We love him because he first loved us. If any man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he has seen... How can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God, loveth God, love his brother also. Okay. So love comes into the heart. What, what is this telling us? We love him because what? Because he first loved us. So... In seeing the love of God and the love of Christ, what they did for us in the plan of redemption, the plan of salvation, it, in, it, it inspires love in our hearts, doesn't it? Looking at gospel workers, uh, the 1892 gospel workers, page 429, it says, We love him because he first loved us. 1 John 4, 19. And it is impossible for us to believe that Jesus endured the untold agonies of the cross for us without having our hearts melted in love to him, for him. And if we love him, we shall be solicitous to please him and obey him. The heart is stirred by the love of Christ, 
the heart stirred by the love of Christ will earnestly inquired, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? So when we love him, we want to serve him. Just like that slave who in the year of release could have been let lo loose, but he said, no, I love my master. He's been so good to me and he's given me everything I need and I've got this wife and children. I'm going to stay with him. And so he covenanted with that all being run through his ear and the ring put in. He covenanted to serve him the rest of his life. Cruden's Concordance, number three, the effect of love on God. Somebody want to read or say John 3.16? Do we have anybody that can recite John 3.16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Thank you. I think we had two talking at the same time, but both of you are so uh, quiet, it was hard to hear either one of you. So when you, when you read, please get closer to your mics. And speak up. And speak up, yes. So this is... Uh, I don't know about now, but when I was young, it was called the best known verse in the scriptures. For God so loved the world that he did what? He gave his only son. He gave his only begotten son. And a lot of people are leaving out the begotten because they don't believe he was begotten. They believe they're role playing and they're the same age, co-eternal. But that's not what the scripture says. It says he gave his only begotten son. Son. So this is the effect of love, the love of God. He loved us enough to give up that most cherished possession of his. Um, I want somebody to also read Romans 5 verse 8. Romans 5 verse 8, please. Okay, I can hardly hear you, so go, get near the mic, please. Um, no, it's not. Mark, can you turn something up? We have low sound today. What's happened? Try it again, Melinda. But God commandeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So God loved us so much that he gave us his son. I'm going to read now out of um, The Fountain of Life by John Flavel, a book that Sister White says has brought a lot of people to a, uh, an understanding of the deep love of God and Christ for us in this plan of salvation. And it says here on page 15, What an astonishing act of love was this then, for the Father to give the delight of his soul out of his very bosom for poor sinners. All tongues must need pause and falter that attempt the expressions of his grace, expressions being here swallowed up, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Here is a so without an as. So loved them. How did he love them? Nay, here you must excuse the tongues of angels. Which of us would deliver a child, the child of our delights, the child in our bosom, an only child? Which of us would deliver this child to death for the greatest inheritance in the world? What tender parent can endure a parting pull with such a beloved child? 
Yet surely never did any child lie so close to a parent's heart as Christ did to his father's. And yet he willingly parts with him, though his only one, the son of his delights, and that to death, a cursed death for sinners, for worse than sinners. Oh, the admirable love of God to men. Matchless love. A love so past finding out. Let all men, therefore, in the business of their redemption, give equal glory to the Father with the Son. As Jesus said in John 5, 23, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father which sent him. If the Father had not loved us, he would never have parted with his Son. This is The Fountain of Life by John Flavel. We print it. It's on page 15 of this book. So that's the love of God that Cruden brings out. The effect of the love of God for man caused him to let go of his most prized possession, his only begotten son. That's the principle of the love of God. Yes. Hey, bless out of everybody. <clears throat> Your uh, mention of uh, so many people are believing, not believing that God, that Jesus is the Son of God, the true Son of God, is primarily because many of the ver verses, interpretations, do not have the word begotten in there. They say one and only. Correct. And they lend that over to believing that he was an earthly son, not a heavenly son. And I don't know how, I haven't looked, I haven't followed that up or done a study on it, but there's so many other scriptures. Oh, yeah, like Nebuchadnezzar to... asking his men, uh, didn't we throw three in there? Now I see four, and the fourth looks like, it has the form of the Son of God. So a exactly. heathen pontiff back then, a heathen king back then, could figure out that God had a son. And that was before well, he was born in Bethlehem. Also, <laughs> also, everything that Jesus prays for in John 17, he doesn't, he makes it very clear all through the New Testament that he was with God before he was here. Yes. And it, yes. I don't. I don't know what how people rationalize these things. As a son, as a son, he was with him. Or a, a king in Old Testament times would not have seen the son of God in his in his form. Um, and, and my other thought is. <laughs> You know, people say, oh, they're co-eternal. They always were because Jesus said, I'm the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. But he came. He's begotten of God. He came from God who is eternal. Therefore, he always has been. It's just like the verses, and I don't have them here because uh, I didn't expect them. But um, in, the, in the scriptures, um, it states that Levi paid tithes. While in the loins of Abraham, his father, he paid him to Melchizedek. So um, that's an interesting concept that I've thought about in reference to Jesus saying, I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. But God had to have had an alone time or he would not have said, let us make man in our image because it is not good that men should be alone. He right. knew what or, alone was. Or, and if they were co-eternal, he was never alone. Or scripture would not say in the beginning. Correct. When John 1, in, in the beginning, there was the Word. Yes. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This separates where the beginning of the Son of God is. It's before creation. Exactly. So, so points of scripture that we fail to, I, I, we have a lot of this in our heads, but because of training, sometimes it's hard to get it. So God gave something that was very near and dear to him so that we could have eternal life. And I don't know about you, but I'm grateful. Back to Cruden's Concordance, um, the effect of love on Jesus. Let's go to our Bibles, John 15, 13. 
John 15, 13. Are they not able to see it in the room, Mark, when you put it up on the screen? Oh, yeah. On the front? Okay. John, uh, we're on page three. So. We're on pa the top of page three now for those who don't, or who, those who want to watch it. John 15, 13. I have it, sister. Okay. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Who did that? It's talking about Christ, isn't it? He did that for us. He laid down his life. So this was the effect of God's love on Christ. God knew, or Christ knew, excuse me, how much his father loved men. And he said, I'll go. I'll pay the ransom. Dad, let me do it. So this was Jesus. Jesus' love, that love of, of man that his father had. Revelation 1.5. Let's go there. Revelation 1.5. Do I have a reader? I will. Okay. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Amen. So... Christ had the deep love of his father and Flavel on page 15 puts it this way. What an astonishing act of love was this then for the father to give the delight of his souls, soul, excuse me, I'm reading from the wrong place. I read you this one down at the bottom of page 15. It says from one wonder, let our souls now turn to another. For they are now in the midst of wonders, adore and be forever astonished at the love of Jesus Christ for poor sinners, that ever he should consent to leave such a bosom and the ineffable delights that were there for such poor worms as we are. Oh, the heights, depths, lengths, and breadths of unmeasurable love how is the love of Christ commended to poor sinners? As the Father loved him, even so, believers, hath he loved you. What manner of love is this? Whoever loved as Christ loves, whoever denied himself for Christ as Christ denied himself for us. And this is what it means to be a disciple of Christ. To understand that God gave his most cherished possession and Christ loved enough to go and pay the ransom. And in that understanding, our love can spring up and pay back by a life of serving him. Get, it says, hence we are informed that interest in Jesus Christ is the true way to all spiritual preferment in heaven. Do you covet to be in the heart, in the favor and delight of God? Get interest in Jesus Christ and you shall presently be there. You see, among men, all things are carried by interest. Persons rise in this world as they are befriended. Preferment goes by favor. And so it is in heaven. Persons are preferred according to their interest in the beloved Son of God. And he points us to Ephesians 1.6. Christ is the great favorite in heaven. His image upon your souls and his name in your prayers makes both acceptable unto God. How worthy is Jesus Christ of all our love and delights? You see how infinitely the Father delighted in him, and shall not our hearts delight in him? Oh, that you did but see this lovely Jesus for yourself. Why do you lavish away your precious affections upon vanity? None but Christ is worthy of them. When you spend your precious affections upon other objects, what is but to dig for dross with golden mattocks? 
In other words, we got our love from God, the Father, and His only begotten Son. And then we turn around and we pour it upon worldly things that are soon to perish. The Lord directs our hearts into the love of Christ. Oh, that our hearts, loves, and delights did meet and concenter with the heart of God in this most blessed object. Oh, the love and depth of the, the love of God. If, if we would contemplate this, we would be finished with earthly things. And how, what greater love there is there than to have one who would give their life? Exactly. Not only their earthly life, but their heavenly station. You're to come down here to, to do what he did for us. And this goes to, again, what we were talking about, the only begotten son. And if you look at uh, John 17, 5, So now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with that glory which I had with thee, before this world was. Yes. And again, in 24, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before foundations of this world. Amen. And that's just two examples. Like you say, there's so many more. Yes. Praise yes. the Lord. Yes. Amen. Oh, what love. And that's the effect. Yes, thank you. That's the effect that God's love had on Christ. And we are told in the spirit of prophecy that he could not see through the portals of the tomb. In other words, he didn't dance down here and think, oh, I'll just go through this pitiful time and be man's substitute and then I'll just go back to heaven. He could not see because he was coming onto territory under the father of lies, as he called Satan. Um, and he did not know if his, if his life was going to be um, enough, you know, if he would fall. And so it was, he could not see through the portals of the tomb when he got there. And that's why in Gethsemane, he sweat great drops of blood. And he said, Father, I know we made this deal, but if you could just let this cup pass from me, because he could not see. He, he felt an eternal separation for you and I because of that. That was the love he had on, uh, for us. Now, he was experiencing death. As close to, he was experiencing as, as close to death as he could consciously encounter it there at Gethsemane. And this is why the angels really came to his aid. Okay. They basically carried him through the Gethsemane ordeal. So he could ordeal. make it to Calvary. Yeah, to get yes. him to the cross. Yeah. Yes. Now, this love, the effect of love on man, what is it? John 1, 6. Somebody want to read that text for us, please? John 1, verse 6. Uh, no, I've got the wrong deal here. It's, oh, first, it's, it's, um, first John, excuse me, first John. I looked at that and thought, that's not right. So this, this is a correction I need to make in the book before I get it printed. So it's first John and there's only one, uh, one chapter. So first John one verse six. I'll so, read it. Thank you. And this is love that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment that as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. And this is love. So if we have love for God, what are we going to do? Walk after his commandments. Walk after his commandments. This is love. Deuteronomy 11.22. Deuteronomy 11.22. Somebody want to read that for us?
Deuteronomy 11.22. I did. Okay. For if ye shall diligently keep all these commandments which I command you to do them, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to cleave unto him. So what's coupled with love here again? A walking, a walking after the commandments of the Lord. This is love for God. This is how we show love for God. It reminds me of a little poem that I have on the wall in the other room about three children who which one loved her most. Um, and one, um, one of them said she loved mama and then fretted and teased all day long until mother was glad she went to play. Another one said he loved her and then his cap went on and he forgot the wood to bring and the water to bring and out the door he went. And obviously this was in a long time ago when they had more chores than we have now in our lazy society. But the third child, little Fran, she said, oh mother, I love you so much. Um, and she showed it by rocking the baby to sleep and then taking the broom and sweeping and, and doing all the chores because she could see that mother was tired. And that's true love. And that's the way love is. If we have deep love like Jacob had, we're going to serve a long time our Lord and Savior and show it in what we do for others. Um, number four in Cruden's Concordance on down, Mark, if you want to put it back on the screen. The person beloved, this is Song of Solomon 2, 2 and 7. Um, our time is slipping and i got a lot more pages here, so I think we'll just read these. As the lily among thorns, so is my loved among the daughters. This was Solomon's beloved. And verse 7 says, I charge ye, O daughters, that ye stir not up, nor awake my love, till he please. So... Love for another individual, the person beloved. And in 1 Corinthians 16, 19 to 22, 1 Corinthians 16, 19 to 22, do I have a reader? This is Paul encouraging the brethren. Do I have a reader? Yeah, I'll read. Yeah, I'll read. Okay. The churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. All the brethren greet you. Greet ye one another with an holy kiss. The salutation of me, Paul, with mine own hand. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. That's excommunicated or disfellowshipped. Yes. Maranatha, our Lord has come. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. Paul's love for the church at Corinth. Amen. So this is Paul's love. This is what drove him to be beaten, to be shipwrecked, to be, to walk. He walked. He, he suffered a lot. He went a lot of miles in the cold and the heat to go to the different churches. Why? Because he loved Christ and his Father so much that he wanted to spread that message everywhere he could. And so this deep love for God gave him the ability to keep going no matter what because of his love for the brethren. He wanted people to be able to hear about the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, John 21. Yeah, go ahead. If you notice uh, in verse uh, 20, uh, 19 there, it's uh, with Priscilla, Priscilla with Aquila, they have the church in their house. Yes, there's four places have, uh, he mentions a so church this is, in the house. This is, I think this is something that uh, Sister White talks about. Yes. Having churches in your home. Yeah. How, how it began how the apostolic church began, how Christ's church began, is how it will finish. That's the three angels' messages. Go ye out to meet him. Yeah. Thank you. Good point. Okay, our next one is John 21, 16, and 17. Do we have a reader? 
I'll read it. Okay. He said to them again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He says unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He says unto him, Feed my sheep. He says unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, Feed my sheep. This was Jesus questioning Peter after his betrayal. Why did he ask him three times? Lovest thou me? Why did he do it three times? Because Peter had denied him because three he betrayed times. Him. Three times he had denied him. And so three times Jesus asked him. Because like we said earlier, you do something three times, a habit set. And Jesus wanted to hear him say, Lord, I do love you. Christ knew he mm -hmm. was converted. He'd seen him go back to the place of Gethsemane and pray after his um, denial, his betrayal of Christ. Christ knew that he had, had repented, but he wanted him to say it. Because when we say things out loud, it's a set principle in our souls. Okay? And so Christ asked him three times, do you really love me? Okay, Cruden's Concordance, what is love? Number five, true friendship or kindness? Let's look up Proverbs 15, 17. He's got it here on the screen if anybody wants to read it. I want to get through some of these, so let's hurry along here. I can read it. Okay. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a stalled ox and hatred therewith. Amen. Okay. Um, Samuel, Brother Samuel, read Ephesians 4.32. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Thank you. And 1 Samuel 20, 15 to 17. Do I have a reader? But also thou shalt not cut off thy kindness from my house forever. No, not when our Lord hath cut off those enemies of David, every one from that face of this earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with that house of David, saying, Let our Lord even require it at the hand of David's enemies. So Jonathan caused David to swear again because he loved him for he loved him as he loved his own soul. You know, as I was growing up, I, I heard a lot about this story, read this story, um, etc., and thought, wouldn't it be nice to have a friend that close and dear? And they did make a covenant with one another, which David did keep. He took Mephibosheth in um, once he found out Jonathan had a son that was still living. And so he kept that covenant because his soul was knit to Jonathan and Jonathan's was knit to him. Um, I was shocked here a couple years ago when an independent individual told me, well, Jonathan and David were gay. And I'm like, where do you get that? Well, out of the scriptures because he loved him better than he loved. Like David says, when he wept over Jonathan's death, his love was better than that of a woman. People today... I'm telling you, we do not understand what true love is. And if we take it to a sexual bedroom thing, every time we say love, I have seen marriages dissolve over people thinking every time a person says, oh, mom, I love you, or, or oh, my grandchild, I love you, that it has sexual connotations. There's a lot of different kinds of love. And we need to understand that this love that David and Jonathan had for one another was a bond that was not a sexual bond, but it was a principle of, and the reason we know that, and I'm not gonna take the time today to go through this, but we could and we maybe should. Jonathan, when he saw David <laughs> without whiskers, he was just a young chap out there 
marching up to Goliath to slay him because he believed that God, the God of Israel, would deliver Israel from this foul-mouthed giant who was cursing the God David loved. When Jonathan saw his pluck and courage, that's when he said, this boy is a man after my own heart. If dad would have let me go, I would have done that. And we know that because he took his servant and climbed up a mountain and took out a bunch of Philist Philistines before that. Or was it before or after? It was after? I'd have to go back and look at these. But here, these boys believed in God and they were under a king who happened to be Jonathan's father and David's father-in-law that was ruled by Satan because he had rejected the word of the Lord. And the Lord had rejected him. And so this bond of union between Jonathan and David, I'm just touching on today, this true friendship and kindness and love that they had for one another was not a sentimental. It was not sexual. It was bound with the love of God, the love of a God who would honor a people and help them in time of need. Exactly. Good point. He sa it says it was a sacrificial love, not a lustful love. And there's a difference. And that's why David, in his weeping, said, Oh, Jonathan, your love for me was uh, surpassed that of a woman. Because it was a sacrificial love. He knew that Jonathan could have disobeyed his father, the king, and said, I, I don't want to go into that battle with dad. It's a death trap. I want to be the next king. And, and he could have left that battle and not obeyed his, his parent so that he could have been the next king instead of David. And that's what David was talking about when he said, it passes that of a, of a woman. And that's right here. And in, in, if you put it back on the screen, honey. It's the next one down, 2 Samuel 1, 25 and 26. I'll just read it since I've spoken of it. It says, How are the mighty fallen in the midst of battle? This is David weeping and, and writing. O oh, Jonathan, thou wast slain in thy high places. I am distressed for thee, my brother. Very pleasant hast thou been unto me. They both loved God. They both loved God. Against all odds. Thy love to me was wonderful, passing that of a woman. He realized that Jonathan had given his life so that David could be king because Jonathan believed that when he was anointed by Samuel, the Lord had called him. And so he did not stand in the way at all. Let's go on to Romans 12, 9 and 10. Do I have a reader for Romans 12, 9 and 10? Before? Before. Before. Yeah. Okay, so Jonathan had done the slaughter of the Philistines before David killed Goliath. That's what I thought. Um, somebody want to read Romans 12, 9, and 10? Good morning, class. You awake? I will. Okay. I've got a reader. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another. That is to be the principle of our lives. And true love, and we'll get into this further on in the lesson, true love, the true love of a parent is not sensual. It is not... Um, it is not of that character that we see today where the child is just allowed to rule the household and uh, oppress the adults. True love will abhor evil and cleave to that which is good. And of course, being born into Satan's territory, we have to be taught this thing. And that's why children are given parents 
Is there more than one kind of love? We've been seeing this natural. Their love is natural, which is either lawful or not lawful. So let's go on here. Um, our next text is Psalm 3412. Do we have a reader? Psalm 3412. What man is he that desireth life and loveth many days that he may see good? So is this a, a lawful thing to love life? Yes, it is. It is, it is lawful. We should love life. We should have a zest for life. We should not um, be upset with God <laughs> for giving us life. I heard about a girl who sued her uh, mother and won. This is how crazy, uh, this is how far truth has fallen in the streets. Uh, was it California? A young girl sued her mother and won because her mother did not consult her before she was conceived to see if she wanted to be born. And now she was grown up and she was having to get a job and live a real life and, and um, make money to take care of herself. And, and she was so chapped. She was suing her mother for it. And the judge ruled in her case, yes, because he, as he said to the mother, you could have gone to a clairvoyant and spoken with her beforehand to see if, if, and I'm thinking, wow, how crazy has this gotten? But she did win. Anyway, um, we should love life, even though it might be th full of trials. God has been gracious to give us life. 1 Thessalonians 4.9. 1 Thessalonians 4.9. Here is another lawful love. 1 Thessalonians 4.9. I'll read it. Okay. But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. So he says, <laughs> you're taught of yourselves. You're taught of God to love one another. And um, I need not really write this to you, but love one another. Be kindly affectionate one to another. Um, there was the... Who was it? Cain. God asked him, where is your brother? And what was his response? Am I my brother's keeper? Am I my brother's keeper? Yeah. Am I my brother's keeper? What? You expect me to take care of my no, brother? I don't know where he is. God knew where he was. But he was trying to invoke in Cain some, some sympathy, some, some love for his brother that he didn't love. He'd been too jealous of. Self had ruled, and he had killed him. Of course God knew where he was. But we are to have, and we need to have love for our brethren, not that just sweeps everything under the rug, but if we see a brother stumbling and falling, um, we need to encourage them to do right. Cain exhibited no remorse for what he had done. So he, he, he would not repent. He, he, yeah. he tried to deny he had any knowledge, which is in the face of God. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when we cut loose from, from that spirit and start serving self, we get blind so fast. He really thought he was bigger than his britches. He really did. So back to Cruden's. Is there an unlawful kind of love? John 12, 25. Do I have a reader? I'll read it. Okay. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. Mm. That hits the nail on the head. He that loves this life he, if we love our lives to where we'll deny Christ, we'll lose eternal life. That is an unlawful love according to God. That's an unlawful love. And then 2 Timothy 3, 2. 
2 Timothy 3, verse 2. Do I have a reader? For men shall be lovers of their own selves, coverture, boaster, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. And it goes on to say, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness. We're not talking about worldlings here. We're talking about believers or professed Christians. <laughs> Thank you. The quote marks, yes. <laughs> Having a form of godliness, but denying the power. What power? The power Christ gives us to overcome. But denying the power thereof. From such turn away. Because this is unlawful love, according to scripture. From such turn away. You know... I just had somebody here about a week and a half ago tell me online, uh, a relative, tell me online that I'm so strict because if I have friends that go into the world, I just cut off with them. I'm like, well, you know, I'm really busy and I have a lot of stuff I'm trying to take care of every day. And the reason I probably don't call that person because it was an individual they were talking about. I said, the reason I probably don't call that person and haven't for a while is because my phone's constantly ringing and I'm trying to give counsel and et cetera, and I have, hardly have time to sleep and eat, let alone think about those who have gone a different way than me. And he said, come on, face it. You've just cut them off. And I said, yeah, I probably have because two can't walk together except they be agreed. And then we got to talking, and by the end of the conversation they were realizing that if we remain lovers of those who are haters of God, maybe it's not a good thing. And this is what I'm learning with this whole thing of putting these three things together. We are in a world that says, I can be an alcoholic and a, a cursor of God and whatever, and you might be trying to follow the Ten Commandments. And if we try and be friends, somebody's going to have to give. But there's a difference between loving and accepting. But the, exactly. But the world says, it's okay. If you love me, you'll, you'll partake of my drink. You'll, you'll do what I want you to do because friends don't make demands on each other. And so um, this is why we're going through this. What is, what is love? And how does this tunnel of love, how does this whole thing bring us to the hour of temptation? And how do we escape that? I've never, in my 60 years of life, I have never, ever heard one sermon on the hour of temptation. And we should be teaching it. We should be talking about it because only a few will escape through that hour of temptation. Only a few will es escape it. And those that escape will have eternal life. Many are, many are called, you are chosen. Yes. We're told this. Amen. Amen. So, Cruden's love is conjugal. And I don't know if we're going to have time to go into this or not. We didn't get as far as I thought we would, but that's all right. Because I want us, I want us at the end of these Sabbath school lessons to thoroughly understand God's way and Satan's way so that we can make a choice. And um, maybe we'll just stop right there because I had a person call me and say, you know your three calls you talked about? I listened to it and then I went back to it and I watched it after it was online and I still don't want, know what the three calls were. And I was just, I was really shocked. I said, I am so sorry. 
I, it's about time I just take a break, three months off, shut up, sit down, do something, because if I'm not making myself plain, I n need not be up here. So I'm gonna ask any, uh, all of you, do you understand what I was trying to say with the three calls last week? And I never brought my notes in here because <laughs> I thought I was gonna try and make it through all these 13 pages, but. Sorry, I missed, so I'm looking forward to what you got to say. Okay. So the three calls that we spoke about in the parable where that Christ told um, about the man making the feast, the first call for us for the last generation came in 1844 and 50,000 left the other churches and came in to this message. And God gave Ellen Harmon, who became Ellen White, dreams and visions visions more to to bring them out of the errors that had come into the other denominations they came out of and when it came down to bringing them from the first and second message into the third message only 50,000 Millerites came into that third message out of over 50 out of around 50,000 people about 48 or 50 people actually came into the third message. Um, sorry. Now let me make that clear. Yeah. You said 50,000 both times. I'm sorry. 50,000 came in under the first and second angel's message. When the third message with the Sabbath came, there was only 49 to 50 people that stayed with the message. And um, I'm being pointed over here. No, we were not on last week. It was the week before. I'm sorry. It was the third Sabbath of um, February that we talked about the three calls. So last, uh, the last Sabbath of every month we take off um, to just breathe. <laughs> it's, it's quite intense um, working full time and doing this as well. Um, so back to the three calls. The first call came to the last generation in 1843, 44, and... Like I said, there were 50 that stayed with the third angel's message, and of course that has grown. But by 1958, they had joined the ecumenical movement and gone back to um, a lot of the teachings that the Advent ban that came through the third message had gotten rid of. We've gone back into Trinitarianism. We've gone back into... And now it slips my mind here. Um, um, no sanctuary. No sanctuary message is, is big right now, even in the independent groups. Through the righteousness by faith message of Jones and Wagner, they're rejecting the sanctuary message because when you think you're saved, you don't need somebody else judging you somewhere. Um, yes, question or comment? I heard a voice. Oh, I was just saying. I was just saying the immortal soul. They go go back to the, the immortal right. soul. Right, that too. In fact, when Mark and I were still trying to get back into a church that had cast us out and taken our names off, um, I think it was about twenty six years ago. We went to a funeral, and the minister preached his brother into heaven. And two or three months later, I had to go sing for a baby funeral of a friend of mine whose grandson had died of SIDS after his childhood disease shots. And that preacher preached to the little baby the whole time. He just kept saying, baby Leo, we're going to miss you, blah, 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 like he was still alive. It just gave me the creepy crawlies. Um, so, and that, I don't know what it is now because we haven't been around Adventism, but I, I know what it was 28, 30 years ago. So yes, you're right, immortality of the soul. So some of these things, they've walked off the platform. In 1958, there was another call. It was made clear when that book came out, there was a rumble. And that's when Arthur White started saying, look, the books have been changed, this and this and this. He gave a lot of information, um, though he did to say his grandmother approved um, to keep his job. Um, but... A few caught on to it then. Hohen Research Library that we inherited in 2012 were some of those people. 
Um, we never personally met Hohen, but his, his wife, um, Anna DeMichael Hohen, uh, was the one that um, gave us the ministry. And so there were a few that understood that they had retreated back to Egypt and they came out. And um, when you read the parable of Christ, my point was there is a cutoff point for the denomination, those that were called and did not come, the master says, um, go burn their city, you know, and then go out into the highways and hedges or the byways and hedges and, and bring in, you know, everybody that you can find. And so there's that, that call going on when there's no possibility of salvation for those who have rejected it. So that was my point through the three calls. I believe there was one in 43, 44, one in 5860, and this is the last one. This is the last call, and it's the same call. Go ye out to meet him. Okay. We have a question, comment, whatever here. Yeah, just a comment, but uh, okay. I have yet to go to a funeral, and I am in my 80s, and I've been to quite a few in very recent days, and I have yet to hear a word of comfort coming. And why is it that everybody seems to ignore the comforting words from God uh, about the funeral? For example, it says in Thessalonians, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Yes. I don't know if there's going to be any dead in Christ in all those churches, because they're already in heaven, you know, and, 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 and the thing I hear a lot too is, you know, they, to prepare a place for you, which Christ would do. But then why don't they put the finish to that statement? And so if Christ is preparing a, preparing a place for you, you best prepare yourself for that place. Amen. And those are two points, and, and they're missing in every one. Not a word right. of comfort. Except a lot of mis, you know, uh, misunderstandings and personal stuff that not having anything to do with the Word of God, and taking passages and using them, you know, I say in error. And I just went to one this week. And I I couldn't get over it. I I was so discouraged. I just wanted to get up and and walk away. Mm. If I get up. Let the dead bury the dead, brother Jim. Let the dead bury. I, I, the dead. I believe since they started doing the celebration of life that they don't share, they don't give comfort at funerals anymore. That's my opinion. That's, Thank you're you. right. If you've read Vatican II councils on the liturgy of the uh, celebration of, of life, that's that's the new funeral services. And, and that's, Jim, that's why they're not doing that they're not comforting the grieving because nobody's supposed to grieve hallelujah he's somewhere else <laughs> just praise not in the fires you know how you many know. how many i heard are looking down at us now yeah. and i'm gonna tell you something and i don't believe it for one second it's the biggest lie and why they do it but they're they believe in satan surely you won't die led to a lot of stuff you know yeah. especially this spiritualism which is growing today like in leaps and bounds, yes, it, it is. seems to me, anyhow. Mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, I think of, you know, I, I lost a daughter five years old to leukemia. And mm -hmm. some of the stuff that we have been going through in our family since then, I can't imagine how she could be happy if she was looking down at us. Mm. You, you, you know, how, how stupid, yeah. how stupid that is, yeah. you know. Uh, what's the matter? Why isn't anybody paying attention? They don't want to pick up their Bibles, and I figured out why, because it's going to cause them to make a change in yeah. their lives, yeah. and they're comfortable in right. their disbelief. You know, I, I spoke with a, a fellow here a couple of weeks ago, and I came off the call crying. It took me a couple of days to recover, because um, he said, um, he's been a leader, he's been a, a speaker. He said that he's been going to a Sunday church for a while 
to kind of understand what they believe. And I said, we already know what they believe. I said, have you asked them about, um, ha have you um, broached? He says, well, yeah, we know they don't believe in the Sabbath. And I said, well, have you broached the eternal burning hell with them? And he said, no. He says, I don't think that's a, he says, if I'm going to work with these people, I re I'm not going to give them a creed. He says, I really don't think that's a, a problem. You know, we could, we could even bring them into Sabbath keeping if, if they believed in, in life after death. And I said, how could you teach them about a loving God and yet let them entertain the thought that he's, <laughs> burn some more, come on, cry, scream. How could you believe in a God who would do that forever for 40 years of poor living? I said, I, 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 can't, I can't understand how you don't see that as a, an issue. I could never love a God, God like that. And he said, well, we don't want to make, you know, we don't want to make it hard for people. And, uh, you know, we lost your mind. Right. this is what Aaron did in the wilderness when they built the calf. He didn't want to upset anyone. Yeah. Uh, but the question that came to my mind the other day on this, this, uh, this eternal soul deal is first thing, though, is this comes from Rome. This is a Roman doctrine that comes out of their uh, right. number 93rd catechism. It's, it's in there. They, they, they. Somehow or another, they melt together the whole, the soul and the spirit. It's all a big lie. Yes. But this is this is what came to my mind. It just came to my mind out of the blue. When someone when someone thinks that their loved one has died and gone to heaven, what came to my mind was so you don't believe in the resurrection. Because if you believe they've died and gone to heaven, there can't be a resurrection for them. And if you don't believe in the resurrection, then you don't believe that Christ died for your sins. Then where's your salvation? Ooh, you're right. Where's your salvation? What what happens when Jesus comes back? Everybody that's saved is going to be already in heaven. What's what's going on? This, you're, you're not making sense. Right. <laughs> Amen. Think about it. And going to the thing about people not reading scripture, the answer to that is really simple, actually. I don't know about you guys, but when I read scripture or when I read Spirit of Prophecy. I'm reading it not only for people that I know, but for myself. Amen. Amen. But when I see something in there that I've got to look at as truth, then I have to look at myself first. Yes. <laughs> and sometimes that's that's sometimes that's not real fun. You're going, oh man, Lord, help me with this. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's a biggie. Amen. Um, he had a comment here, and then Rosie will take yours. Go ahead, Samuel. I was just going to say, um, I talked to somebody who believed in life after death like just a few weeks ago and their answer is they believe in the resurrection they just believe that you get joined back your spirit gets joined back with your body and i had all kinds of questions on that and we didn't make it anywhere so the answer is they have an answer it's just a very bad one <laughs> okay yeah it has to be because it's not biblical go ahead rosie yeah, most people in the world, even myself included as a child, we all learned John 3.16 and we don't know where we even learned it from, whether we've been in Christian families or not. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him shall have everlasting life. So these people that want to believe in a everlasting burning hell go against John 3.16 because these people that are living in hell, in their opinion, is are getting eternal life in hell. So John 3.16, which is very well known, is just all you need to know to work out that you don't live in eternal burning hell. Amen. Amen. I never thought of it that way. Yeah, so, and how, so how loving would that be? Yeah. How much... How much what kind of God would love us like that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Amen. I, I love the Bible. In fact, um, where it says there'll be ashes under the feet of the righteous in the Psalms is uh, was really a sticking point in my mind as I read the Bible when I was young because there's going to be a finish point to all the pain and the sorrow. And of course he says 
the, the Bible says he will wipe away all our tears from our eyes. There will be no more pain, no more sorrow. You cannot have an eternal burning hell and have no pain, no sorrow, no, no, no crying anymore. Go ahead, Brother Jim. There's only two things. And Ron Toll and I have been going over a lot of stuff. And we got a thing going where uh, who, who do you believe or which do you believe? And we give examples of God's word. And we give example of what the world believes. And we come up with it. And, and here's the story is that Satan told the first lie, which was not true. And in doing so, he also called, imagine this. He called God a liar. Surely you won't die. Uh -huh. That's calling God a liar. That's right. Right off there. So who do you believe? God said that surely you will die and the wages of sin is death. And, <clears throat> you know, and then you go into the state of the dead and there's so much that could be said, but you, you got to get real about it. And this is one thing I love about what Ellen White wrote. And one thing, she says, take the Bible simply as it reads. Amen. 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 That's, uh, a, that's a good point because that's exactly what the Roman church teaches in their catechism, that the soul is immortal, which to me says loud and clear, plain as day, that is the mark of the beast. That, that church, that, that affiliation, that worship day that they, that they honor, that is clearly the mark of what that is. Amen. Satan's church. Amen. So, I mean, it was the, but that when I got that, that has been fairly recent. But when I, so when I got that, I it was totally clear. It's totally clear what the Roman church is and what it's out to do. Amen. Well, we're down at the bottom of the, uh, the half hour after 12. So I want to read one more statement. This is from unpublished um testimony Spalding and McGann on page 324 it says perilous times are before us everyone who has a knowledge of the truth should awake and place himself body soul and spirit under the discipline of God wake up brethren wake up the enemy is on our track we must be wide awake on our guard against him we must put on the whole armor of God, not just have the shield of faith and be naked because we refuse to put on the whole armor. We can't have just the shield. We have to put on the whole armor of God. We must follow the directions given in the spirit of prophecy. We must love and obey the truth for this time. That's our marching orders. That's our marching orders. So as Brother Jim said, study the Bible and take it as it reads. We're to have no kings, no rulers, no popes among us at this time, but to diligently, personally heed the messages that have brought us out from the world. Signed, Ellen B. White. Okay. More next week. We only got to page five, but... Um, we can do that. I want to, I want to make sure we get this and understand what the love of God is, what the love is that we're to have, the love that we're not to have, etc. Let's kneel together in prayer, please. Our most heavenly father, we are so thankful that you are not a tyrant that you don't enjoy watching people hurt, be in pain, suffer. You are a merciful God. And this is why when the seven last plagues come, it's called your strange act. But love would not be love without justice. I pray that you will help us to understand your love and to fear you and give glory to you in our lives. Help us to be like that slave who was willing to go up against the doorpost before the judges and have an awl driven through his ear and a ring put in it to show that forever 
He wanted to serve his master. Until he died, he was willing to serve that master because he loved him. Give us this kind of love, Lord. We need this kind of love. We don't have it. We know we don't have it because we're told that when primitive godliness arises once again in the church, we will see persecution. And right now, we don't see much of that. A little painful things are said to us. But we don't know what persecution is like they did in the 1260 years of papal persecution. I pray that Lord Jesus, your call to Peter, Peter, three times denied you and three times you said, do you really love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? May that call sound in our ears and may we personally each one say, thou knowest I love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.